Awakening to the sound of explosions, Rear Admiral Kenneth K. Vett, commander of U.S. Naval Forces Vietnam, moved to the rooftop of his rented house to witness a dazzling display of rockets and flares lighting the Saigon night sky. All around him, the sound of battle in the early hours of January 31, 1968, heralded the arrival of the 1968 Tet Offensive. Armed with automatic weapons and hand grenades, the Admiral and his housemates waited for the assault on their quarters they knew were coming. During the remaining hours of darkness, Veth kept informed of events by listening to military police and other tactical communications on the radio. Since he spent the night on the roof of his house, he was unable to direct operations from his headquarters. The Admiral was not the only senior commander caught napping. As early as July 1967, the communist leadership and military strategists in North Vietnam were preparing their biggest blow against the forces in the South. Ho Chi Minh and General Vo Nhu Yen Gap had decided to stage a series of attacks all across South Vietnam. Their intention was to overwhelm the South Vietnamese military and U.S. allies, causing the collapse of the South Vietnamese government. The enemy used a number of feints and deceptions to decoy the U.S. forces, as well as the U.S. government. With offers to go to the peace table diverting the attention of President Johnson, attacks such as the siege of Khe Sanh forced the military to concentrate their forces in the countryside and away from the cities. At the same time, NVA forces and supplies were moved down the logistic track of the Ho Chi Minh Trail and the Mekong River. Stockpiles were built up in the safe areas of Laos and Cambodia. Caches in South Vietnam were filled and more were established. As many as 84,000 Viet Cong and NVA troops were in position to conduct the campaign, scheduled to coincide with the Lunar New Year in 1968. U.S. operational commanders generally placed a low emphasis on intelligence collection, and it was only in isolated cases that field commanders were successfully given intelligence briefs and then meaningfully debriefed after an operation. Reports of increased foot traffic from Laos and Cambodia were ignored. Analysis of such information would have assisted the field force in interdicting enemy forces. Rather than utilizing their special warfare skills for intelligence purposes, operating forces often misuse the SEALs, Rangers, LERPs, and SOG as covert infantry units. Their abilities to conduct infiltration and reconnaissance, as well as to run agent nets, were often ignored in the rush to employ them in disrupting and destroying specific enemy targets. But if you attacked, your cover was blown. The enemy knew you were there. The thing with the ambushes, it, it was pretty tricky. Usually, it was a three to five man element that would come into your kill zone where you prepared an ambush on a trail. Uh, you'd blow claymores on them and then get up and finish them off with your rifles, uh, check bodies, check equipment, uh, get any intelligence value you could, and then move to a landing zone for extraction because once you were compromised, once the enemy knew where you were or that you were in the, the area, then you were pulled out. American crews were affected by pressure to produce results. An advisor who served in the Mekong Delta observed, American PBR crews will stop anybody and take in 50 people and call them suspects if they feel that the pressure is on them to come up with some suspects. Despite numerous warnings from the LERPs and SEAL teams in the field, the intensity, coordination, and timing of the Tet Offensive surprised the American intelligence community in Vietnam. In addition to a flawed intelligence collection effort, command misunderstood critical information, resulting in American forces being improperly deployed and surprised when Saigon and numerous other targets were attacked on January 31st. During the planned Tet Truce, Task Force 117, Riverine Force, was scheduled to deploy into western Dinh Thuong and eastern Kien Phong provinces, 
where it was expected to interdict intensified enemy resupply efforts. Captain Robert S. Salzer, the commander of the Riverine Force, later recalled, It was a show-and-tell operation. There was no reason whatsoever to be there. We went up there along the skinniest canal we could till we ran out of water completely. Then we plowed through the mud some. Nothing much happened. There was no reason for anything to happen. The Viet Cong were all the way to the east of us by this time. So much for what American intelligence thought they knew. On the morning of January 30th, the task force received word that the Tet Truce was canceled. Offensive operations resumed but infantry units remained near canals for rapid redeployment. The next morning, the situation in the Delta deteriorated quickly as enemy forces attacked Mai To, Ben Tre, Kale, Kai Bay, and Vien Long. We began to hear rumors that things weren't going quite so well in our splendid isolation. Bill Countown, who was a brigadier general, then flew in saying, my God, it's Pearl Harbor over again. A Reverie Army Company was airlifted to Vinh Long to support Arvin forces at 1810 on the 31st. Another company was flown to reinforce the defenses of the permanent Riverine base at Dong Tam near Mai To. During the night, the majority of the task force withdrew to Dong Tam, where they arrived before dawn despite enemy harassment, including an ineffective ambush. In the fiery glow of nearby fighting, the Riverine force was resupplied and moved out at daybreak. At 1550 on February 1st, these forces were hurled into battle in Mai To and subsequently at Vinh Long and Ben Tre. In the end, the Riverine task force was credited with saving the Delta. Meanwhile, in anticipation of increased enemy infiltration of supplies from Cambodia, TF-116 River Patrol Force had deployed nine PBRs patrol boats river to the Cambodian border region. Along with the boats came eight platoons of SEAL Team 2. The SEALs were based at the U.S. Army Special Forces Camp at Chow Dock on the upper Basak River in the northwest of the Mekong Delta. They were ordered to Chow Dock to observe a possible large enemy crossing into South Vietnam. Eight was operating with mercenaries from the area, mostly Cambodians and Chinese. What eight did not realize was that the crossing had already occurred, and the 13-man team was picked up by a company of NVA regulars. The outgunned platoon eight was forced to form a strategic withdrawal. The fight was intense. The repositioning of PBRs to Shao Dock may have had little impact on infiltration but the vessels proved crucial in repelling a major ground attack on the city during Tet. Elsewhere during Tet, TF-116 units engaged enemy forces at Mai To, Ben Tre, Vin Long, Sadek, the Saigon area, and the LCU landing craft utility ramp at Hue. During Tet, market time forces became engaged in a number of firefights involving sampans, and provided naval gunfire support to forces ashore. Harbor Defense Patrols, Operation Stable Door, engaged enemy swimmers during the early hours of January 31st, but were unable to prevent damage to the bow of the Norwegian tanker Pelican in Cameron Bay. A Warden X-ray, a one, this is Warden X-ray. I have Sampan crossing up ahead. Uh, break, I will uh, attempt to intercept. Take off. Despite extensive commitments and support of Allied forces ashore during the Tet fighting, TF-115 thwarted four enemy trawlers at the end of February, attempting to simultaneously infiltrate supplies into the Republic of Vietnam. <laughs> 